Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us today at what is uh, a highlight of uh, today's conference. Um, I'm Ivan Fong, I'm general counsel of 3M. For purposes of today, all you need to know about 3M is that we were founded 118 years ago in 1902 in the great state of Minnesota, and we remain headquartered there to this very day. As a member of PBI's Corporate Pro Bono Advisory Board, uh, it's a real honor and pleasure for me to introduce today's keynote speaker. I first met uh, Attorney General Keith Ellison uh, several years ago uh, when he was a member of Congress representing Minnesota's fifth congressional district, which by the way is where I live. So uh, we've, I've been a, my wife and I have been a longtime constituent of yours, uh, Attorney General. Uh, we met when uh, Attorney General Ellison attended the opening of 3M's uh, then new state-of-the-art R&D center at our headquarters campus in St. Paul. Attorney General Ellison knows that a fair economy for all requires companies that operate fairly, responsibly, and with integrity. And while we sometimes sit on opposite sides of the negotiating table, Attorney General and we share a vision in which government exists to promote the public good by representing the interests and protecting the rights of all of its members. So it's no surprise that the topic of our keynote address today is racial and social justice. Attorney General Ellison has devoted his life to defending and protecting civil and human rights. From his time as a community activist and in private practice, specializing in civil rights and defense law, to his time as executive director of a public interest law firm called Legal Rights Center, to his service in the Minnesota House of Representatives, and then as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, to his election in 2018 as Minnesota's Attorney General. Attorney General Ellison, long been a champion for consumer, worker, environmental, and human rights protections for all Minnesotans. He's also been a pioneer and a trailblazer in so many ways. He was the first African-American representative in Congress from Minnesota and the first Muslim American ever elected to Congress. And as state attorney general, he was the first African-American and first Muslim elected to statewide office in Minnesota. In the House of Representatives, he founded the Congressional Consumer Justice Caucus and was co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. But the real reason Attorney General Ellison is the most fitting keynote speaker at this conference today is his recent appointment as the lead prosecutor of the officers charged with the murder of George Floyd. Only four weeks ago, the nation and the world watched in horror as Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin was videotaped kneeling on the neck of a handcuffed and subdued George Floyd for almost nine minutes. It was brutal, atrocious, and sickening. And it galvanized the public in a way that is creating history in real time. George Floyd was a tipping point for a long overdue reckoning about structural racism, racial equity, and social injustice. For before him, there was Philando Castile, Jamar Clark, Ahmed Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Nina Pop, Eric Garner, Trayvon Martin, Freddie Gray, and many, many others. On May 26th, the day after the tragic killing, Chauvin and the three other officers at the scene were fired. On May 29th, Hennepin County Attorney Mike Freeman announced the arrest of Chauvin and charged him with third degree murder and manslaughter. Two days later, on May 31st, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz announced that Attorney General Ellison would step in and lead the case. And on June 3rd, Attorney General Ellison filed second degree murder charges against Chauvin and aiding and abetting charges against the other three officers involved. 
Attorney General Ellison, thank you for rising to national prominence and seeking justice for George Floyd. And thank you for taking time from your busy schedule to come deliver today's keynote address at the Pro Bono Institute's virtual conference. We're looking forward to your remarks at this difficult time for us as a country. Please join me in welcoming the Attorney General of Minnesota, Keith Ellison. Keith. Hey there. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you so much. What an honor to be with everybody at the Pro Bono Institute. Uh, thank you, Eve. Uh, thank uh, Eve Runyon, Ivan Fong, both of you. I appreciate this opportunity to talk with you. And it is true that I got a lot of things cooking nowadays, uh, as everyone does. But I will say that I can't think of any better place to be than with a group of lawyers dedicated to the idea that we have to have equal justice under the law for everyone. No one's above the law. No one can say, I do whatever I want and I don't have to have any consequences. No one's beneath the law so that you can do anything to them you want and they can never do anything about it. And we all uh, swore an oath when we became attorneys, when we went and raised our hand, whether it was one person in a courtroom or a group of people at a, at a, at a, bar, at a, a bar swearing in, we all swore that we would uh, not only factor in pecuniary interests, not only the money, but that we would have a higher calling and a higher service uh, to the cause of justice. We're officers of the court and we are in the justice business. If you're a lawyer, you're in the justice business. Whether you're a business lawyer or a public defender, no matter what you do, yes, it's true you have to advocate for your client, but there is nowhere in any ethical rule I have ever seen that said you needed to do anything for your client. We are bound by ethical rules. We do have a duty to justice, and we should advance that cause whenever we can. Now, it's also true that, um, you know, being a lawyer is actually a pretty privileged thing to be. And we're in, a privilege, we're in a privileged position. We're in a position to earn pretty decent money. If you, once you get into law school, if you finish, you probably are gonna be at least middle class and probably could be much more successful than that. And I believe that whoever is uh, blessed to uh, have much, they're also obligated to do much. And that means that you should do some pro bono uh, you should you should take what the resources and the and the skills that you have and the license that you carry to do good for others, uh, even if it's not um, remunerative for you in the in the short term. You should take cases, uh, refugee and asylee cases. You should take eviction cases. You should take uh, help help uh, folks who are too um, low income to afford counsel. You should, you should get involved in the legislative process and help uh, move forward, just, fair, helpful legislation. And, uh, you know, it, it's no, there's no fault on you for doing well in this world, but if you only do well for yourself, I think that's a misuse of your law degree and you should, you should think about what your responsibility is for the larger community. Now, when it comes to this issue of George Floyd, let me just tell you a few things you may not know. One is I didn't ask for this case. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the attorney, the, the uh, Hennepin County attorney said, look, um, it would help if you and I did this thing together. I said, fine. Mike Freeman is a friend. He's a good lawyer. Um, and he asked me to be involved. And I said, sure, I'm never going to tell you no. Uh, if I can assist the cause of justice, I'm going to be part of that. And then the governor said, I want you to be the lead prosecutor on this. I said, yes, sir. Uh, but this was nothing we were running around trying to get. But once I agreed that we're going to do this, once I knew we had the capacity, uh, there was not one single cell in my body that I'm not throwing at this thing 100%. And we put together a very strong team. Uh, we, are, we are working very hard. We're writing. We're doing everything we need to do. We're thinking of every single possible uh, research, uh, research issue that needs to be uh, looked into. We're investigating. Uh, actively, and I believe that we will be well, well prepared uh, at the critical time. Just so you know, the omnibus hearing is going to be on um, September 11th, and the trial date is set for March 8th. And uh, that uh, seems like a long way off, but trust me, it's going to be right here before you know it. And uh, then, you know, uh, all of the trauma that people lived 
through over the last several weeks uh, could well be brought back up. Um, but we're going to be professional. We're going to be fair. We're going to zealously represent the people of the state. Uh, and we're going to make sure that there's a fair trial. Uh, and so whatever outcome uh, comes about, and I have a certain idea about what the outcome should be, as you might guess, uh, but it will be considered a fair outcome uh, where everybody had all of their rights uh, fully vindicated. And at the end of that, I'm confident that the state will prevail uh, for the charges that we've made, um, but it will be done in a fair way. Now, the question is, why do we always seem to be here? I mean, I've been read, read, a, li read a list of big people who are victims of excessive force. And yeah, it's true. All of them were right there and all those cases happen. Why does it happen with so much frequency? Well, I, I invite you to investigate that yourself. I have a few ideas I want to share, but it is sort of like the question of the moment. I don't know anywhere else to start other than here. Our country held people in bondage for 243 years, and it took an apparatus, a policing apparatus, to maintain them in that situation. It took dogs, it took horses, it took patrols, it took it made it, you know, you had to, it made, they made it illegal to teach a black person to read. It was illegal for a black person to know how to read. And, and you know, you, you didn't own your children. Uh, anybody could be sold off from you. You could be sold. If you ran away, you would be guilty of the crime of theft. Theft of what? Yourself. And so that, our country existed in that condition longer than it did in any other condition. And we cannot escape that reality. And then 100 years after that, uh, we were in a state of second-class citizenship. From 1865 to 1965, we existed in a state where it was fully lawful, legal, within the law and places in this country for uh, Black people to occupy a subordinate role in society. We all know about uh, Rosa Parks. Think about it. That was in 1955. Trust me, you know people who were around in 1955. You know people who were adults in 1955. And it was perfectly legal to say that if you are African ancestry, you cannot sit on the front of the bus. You cannot live here. You cannot go to this school. You cannot do this. You cannot do that. And in every aspect of life, there was what we call Jim Crow segregation. And then after 1965, after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, it's only been 55 years. So compare 55 years to 343 years. Because for 343 years, the United States maintained a system of state-sponsored subordination based on race. It's only been 55 years since anything else has existed. Now I'm 56 years old. And so what I'll say to you is, since 1965, yeah, we ended segregation, but there have been disparities in every aspect of American life. Disparities in health, disparities in criminal justice, disparities in policing, disparities in housing, disparities in employment, disparities, disparities, disparities. You show me an aspect of American life and I will show you where the allocation of resources and opportunity has racial disparities. This is not to be unexpected, it is to be expected. Well, how do you maintain a situation where, you know, and how do you maintain an equal, unequal society? You need policing to do it. Could you go back to slavery? Could you maintain slavery without policing, without deputizing every white male and saying that you, if you see one of them, you can demand it for their papers and, and they better have them or else. And under segregation, same thing. So the system of, so the thing is when we ended legal segregation in America, we had set in motion disparate outcomes for people. And so in 65, we didn't even need the signs anymore. People already had inherited generations of privilege and advantage and generations of disadvantage. You should know the Federal Housing Authority did not allow, it would not insure mortgages in black neighborhoods. So black people were, rent, were relegated to being renters forever. And so 1965, we have, we have to pass credit 
a fair credit reporting law because we didn't have fair credit reporting because you could walk into a bank and it didn't matter if you were a doctor with $100,000 in the bank, you might not get a loan. And if you did, you'd pay more for it than a white counterpart. This is our country. And so what about policing? Police are intelligent people. They know what society expects of them. What are you doing over here? You don't look like the kind of person who should be over here. You look like the kind of person who I can treat however I please. You look like the kind of person where if I don't respect you, I get away with that. And so our system of policing has simply grown out of our historic circumstances. What do we do about it now? Well, we have to look at it squarely in the face and ask ourselves, do we want liberty and justice for all or not? And let me be real clear, African people of African descent are not the only ones who've suffered in America. There's no Native Americans. There used to be the Chinese Exclusion Act, the Act of Congress. We all remember, well, I remember the brutal beating of Vincent Chin, who was beaten to death because he uh, was of Chinese ancestry. And people in Detroit, some people were pissed off because the Japanese automakers were out competing them. And you know, so we, we in, it, in the Latino community, we know that we know that when Brown versus Board of Education was passed in uh, 1954, the companion cases were Mexican Americans in Los Angeles. So we know all about our nation's history of advantaging some and disadvantaging others. It's just a reality. But the question is, those of us in 2020, are we going to just continue to let it exist this way? I say we get rid of it. And what does that mean? That means that at a corporation like 3M or at a nonprofit like, I don't know, United Way or at a small business or at the attorney general's office, we've got to begin working in small groups to say, how can we make sure that we're making sure there's opportunity for everybody? How can our economy be one where anybody can aspire to prosperity if they work hard? We've got to dismantle these structures that have existed for so long because we didn't put them in place, but by our, by our uh, ignorance and by our neglect, they maintain their presence in our place. Now, what are some things we can do? Well, one thing you could do is you could, in, is, as a lawyer, you could say that, look, how do we make sure that police are accountable? Why do we have a system where the chief can literally fire an officer who's been responsible for excessive force multiple times and the arbitrator just puts them right back on the force. Can, you know, those of you who know something about arbitration and contracts, is there something you can write about that? I think so. What can we do about housing? I mean, as, as our people uh, uh, of color and even low income whites subject to eviction so often, I mean, what can we do to invest in public housing? I mean, maybe we should invest in to make sure that we don't have people living in tents all over Minneapolis and every other major city in America. Has anybody noticed all the people just living in tents, just driving by the roadside? Who's seen that? We all see it. You know, we live in a society that was ample enough money to make sure everybody has a roof. And how would that change things? You know, and just in terms of criminal justice, what if we said we're gonna have a lot of mental health and a lot of chemical health and not so much jail cells? It will work. Why does it work in Europe? It works there. You know, it, it could work here too, but our uh, fundamental assumptions about what works and what doesn't, you know, are what we need to challenge. Our only true limitation is our lack of imagination. But this is a time for a reckoning. I would say that it is critical to engage in small group conversation. It is critical to identify helpful pieces of legislation that could help. It's important to understand that nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. And I would get to work on those things. Um, let me say, you know, um, you all asked me a series of questions that I would like to take up. And so um, I try to answer the first one about, you know, why is change so slow? It's because we're mired in you know, 400 years of history. And as Americans, we don't really like history that much. Other countries think 400 years, that's nothing. Us, oh, three years ago is an eternity. 
but we all are stuck in that historical phenomenon. Now, the other thing is that, you know, the question was, the Minnesota legislature failed to pass a police reform bill. Some suggest real change will require action from the state legislature. Are there opportunities for real change? Absolutely there are, but we're gonna have to have citizens say to our legislators that they want to reform policing and make it more equitable and fair. If you don't share your views with the people who represent you about this, then they're not going to operate on the basis of what you prefer. And I can tell you, I was in state legislature for four years. I was in Congress for 12. People really do listen to what their constituents say. But so many constituents think, oh, well, that congressperson, that legislator doesn't listen to me. They do listen to you. You get three, four, five calls on the same topic. You're now thinking, OK, I better deal with this. So please do call and say, we expect you to do something. There's going to be another special session. And I would hope that people would call up and let their legislators know what they want. Very, very important. Let me also uh, note a few other things that I think are really, really important uh, for our conversation. And that is, I think that, and this may surprise you to hear me bring this up because it's not exactly on the issue of, of policing. But I think that we need to look at the entire criminal justice system from policing to jails and bail. There's a whole bail reform movement right now Every offense should be bailable. Many of them, bail is so high that people don't get out. We do know that if people can't make bail, some people aren't getting, getting a jail sentence. They're losing their liberty simply because they don't have 100 bucks to bail out. Nobody should be in jail because they can't afford to get out. You should be in jail because public safety and flight risk require that you be there. But then there is the trial and the whole plea bargaining thing forces a lot of people to plead guilty who aren't even guilty because if somebody tells you if you plead guilty today you can get out but if you don't plead guilty you're going to get a trial and then and, but you can't bail out so that's a month from now a lot of people like screw it i'll plead guilty see a lot of people who plead guilty who didn't even do it and then you got the whole sentencing and how people based on race and income uh, get different sentences for doing the same thing based on the same criminal history and then and so you it was so on down the chain Right now, we are asking ourselves critical questions about a um, conviction integrity unit. Uh, we're thinking very carefully about that. We would need volunteers if we did it. It could be an opportunity for you to do pro bono stuff with the attorney general's office. But we're in the early stages of the project. So we're not quite there yet, but I will keep you all informed as we move forward. We want to make sure that we use uh, the prison resource for people who need it people who are dangerous, not people who just happen to plead guilty because, or they got bad luck. There's been a lot of exonerations. And so many of them are people who uh, just simply had social or economic um, disadvantages, you know, and it's wrong. Um, now there's another question around defunding or disbanding the police. You know, I think it's important to recognize this is a tag, you know, like a hashtag. It's a slogan. People don't want to use the word reform because they've been calling for reform forever. So they feel like they needed a stronger term than reform, like transform. But it is, it is designed to provoke. But people know, I've, had, I've talked to these folks who use this phraseology, and it's important for us all to recognize they, they know that there's domestic violence. They know there's sexual assault. They know there's communities, there's shootings in the community that don't have anything to do with the police. They know that there is a need for a, a peace and security system. What they're saying is it doesn't have to be so heavily dependent upon force and violence. Maybe we need more people who understand chemical dependency and trauma. And do you really need somebody, four guys with a gun, to deal with a fake $20 bill case. What if somebody without a gun would have showed up at Cup Foods and says, okay, 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 okay. What happened, <laughs> right? And started just taking evidence and started, you know, just sort of dealing and figuring out what happened. 
And it's like, you know what? I think you deliberately passed that $20 bill, or I don't think you did pass that uh, 2020 deliberately or whatever. And then based on that, you get a summons in the mail. And if you, they think you did it, there's probable cause you show up, you got to deal with that. But why or why do we need all these people to show up with guns using force over a fake 20? That's a fair question. That's a fair question. So the people say, oh, disband the police, how ridiculous. Well, do you know they did disband the police in Camden, New Jersey. They also reconstituted the police. But they fired everybody and they made them apply for their jobs back. And they said, you cannot work here unless you are willing to go by a certain code. So this is not a crazy out, outlandish idea. It happens. How many people do you know who believe we need to dismantle schools and then reconstitute them? We do it with education. What if you had an endemic problem in a police department you could not root out? You might need to reconstitute that. So I don't want to keep you all too long, but I do want to just say that uh, I am so, so, so admiring of your work. I want to be encouraging. I want to encourage you to do pro bono. And, if, and, and some people will do that. All they want to do is public interest law, and then you can come work for the uh, attorney general's office. But if you want to work in the private sector, you know, get a nice crib, you know, nice Cadillac out there. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with you doing well. But take some pro bono cases and help some people who need you. Nothing wrong with you doing well, but also do some good too. So that you can look in the mirror and feel good about who you are and what you do and the contributions you make to our society. There's better women's shelters that need you. There's people who are in refugee status, asylum status, who need your help. There's people being evicted from their home who need you, need what you can offer. Don't turn them down. Make the time. All right. That's all I got for you all today. Well, thank you very much, Attorney General, uh, General Ellison. This is Eve Runyon. I'm the president and CEO of Pro Bono Institute. We are thrilled that you were able to join us this afternoon for PBI's virtual conference. And we are also honored to have you talk to us about these really difficult and important issues. I know you have a, a hard stop, and so we're going to have to let you go. But this has been a fantastic experience, and I appreciate you coming and sharing your perspective and also taking time to answer some of the questions that we have for you. I would invite those of you who are attending, if you have additional questions, please either email them to pbi at pbi at probonoinst.org. Ivan, thank you for joining us and for introducing Keith this afternoon. Do you have any parting words that you'd like to share before we sign off? Just to say thank you again to Attorney General Ellison. That was very powerful, uh, very, very compelling, uh, and, uh, and much needed. So uh, huge appreciation uh, for your service, for the work that you are doing, and for your encouragement and for your hope. I think in this day of uh, stress and anxiety, over the coronavirus and uh, racial uh, justice uh, issues. We need all the encouragement and hope we can get. So uh, we're profoundly grateful for you and for that. And thank you, Eve, for, for hosting and, and for all the conference participants. Thank you. Thank you all again. And I will just uh, sign off by echoing uh, the Attorney General's comments that we are in the business of doing justice. And so I encourage you to continue to do good continue to do pro bono. We have much work to do, but together we can make a real difference. So thank you all.